the idea is to talk about you know a little bit more detail than you might see in other places on the internet about how to figure out what uh, you can afford in terms of an ADU. So we wanted to help people figure out um, kind of some of the basics of developing a budget and um, going through the financing process so they can figure out how much they can afford and whether or not it financially makes sense to add an ADU um, based on your needs. And I'll let, um, before we get started with the presentation, maybe I'll let Carlos um, introduce himself and his expertise. Hey all. Um, Carlos Blizzola, nice to meet you. i have um, uh, CEO of BuildZig for uh, about 12 years. Uh, I've been a uh, builder myself um, for uh, about 10 years. I've built anything from uh, additions to single family homes, ground up to apartment buildings, uh, mid rises. Uh, we hold a GC license in our company and also do a number of um, projects for clients where we manage the entitlement process. Well, site assessments, entitlements, all the way through building acquisition, building permit acquisition. And uh, also because I've been a developer on our own projects, I've done a number of my own pro formas and um, can also go through numbers for um, uh, ADUs and um, the uh, benefits of various approaches to ADUs. Thank you. So um, we're going to uh, do a quick presentation about the um, kind of going through what you can afford. Um, and I, I'm just going to start at the top. The first step in uh, developing and understanding what you can afford is where you're going to build the unit and developing a budget. There are certain types of ADUs which are more cost effective than others that, that are cheaper. So if you're converting a, a basement or a garage in particular, those are gonna be in general cheaper than a standalone ADU, especially if they have an existing foundation. Sometimes um, basements already, you know, you have that illegal unfinished basement. It's gonna be on the, the cheaper side than having to build a whole new foundation and, um, and to create uh, create basically a small house in your backyard. So the first step in figuring out kind of what a what you're going to what your what you're able to afford is figuring out the general cost parameters around that. If it's um, a finished basement that's just going to be have some minor upgrades, it might be as little as a hundred dollars a square foot. On the other end if you're uh, building a whole new ADU in the backyard and there's a complicated foundation, it might be as high as 450 a square foot. So, and you wanna make sure when you're developing that budget to include all of your permits and design fees. So that all in how much you would be looking to spend. Um, the second step in uh, kind of figuring this out, and the first two steps are gonna be a little bit iterative. Like you might have to go back and forth between these first two steps is if well, first of all, if you already have the money, then either your budget fits it or it doesn't. So congratulations there. Uh, most people obviously finance their ADU and um, pay it back out of uh, the potential income that they would have received or uh, or um, their own cash flow, their own personal income. So the next step is to find out kind of what your loan terms are and what you can qualify for. If you're doing it based on the equity of your existing property, normally they're only going to allow you to have what's called a loan to value of 70 to 80 percent. That means that the value of your home, that the overall mortgage of your house cannot exceed 70 to 80 percent of your um, of the value of your home. And that, I'm sorry to just to clarify that would be not exceed 80 percent, 70 to 80 percent. So one of the things that you'd want to talk about with your lender is how much equity you have and how much and <laughs> how much they would be willing. To, sorry. Okay. A little bit of lag. Sorry. You see me now? Sorry. Good. 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 So okay. when you're working with your finance, when you're working with your lender, you're figuring out how much equity and how much loan um, for an ADU the bank will be able to pay. The other things that you're going to be looking at is what is your what is your loan payment? Um, 
in terms of your loan payment, some lenders are do bridge financing and they'll give you a period of time during the construction where you're not paying interest, or they might do an interest only program and then you um, progress to a repayment plus interest. So figuring out what those loan terms are and whether or not your budget fits within those parameters is are the first two steps of figuring out how much of an ADU you can afford. You all, the next thing to look at is your construction time, because when you look at your, you need to figure out how much time you would be potentially making that interest only payment based on your loan, um, and whether or not you have the um, the personal personal cash flow in order to make those payments. Um, you also have to consider in terms of the financing how much they're going to require down. So you're looking at all of these different financial variables as you proceed forward. Some um, types of construction are, have a very short time, fr time frame. For instance, if you were doing a modular unit, um, it might be just a, a month to three months to get the permits and get it installed versus a longer time frame if you're doing build to suit. Um, and the reason that that is important is because if you're assuming you're having a tenant in there, then you're looking at how long is it going to take for me to get a tenant into the unit. Um, so the first, so we figured out a budget, we have figured out our loan terms, you figured out how long is it going to take for me from the moment I pull the loan to actually getting a tenant in, then you're also going to look at, well, what would that actual unit rent for? And the easiest way to do that is to go onto Zillow or Craigslist or whatever is used in your area and see it, what comparable unit the, an ADU um, versus, a, an, a, for instance, an apartment in a luxury building. You really want to look in your area and you want to look at something that is as close to the type of housing that you have. Try to get three to five similar uh, units and then average the cost. So now at this point, you should have an, an idea of how much your loan payments are, whether or not your budget can, whether or not that loan can, can support your budget. And now you have the rental income that you, uh, you anticipate getting. Now you're able to calculate the cash flow. So you're going to take uh, the rental income and you're going to subtract any expenses that you would have related to that, um, to that unit. Things to consider would be whether or not the tenant's going to pay utilities, um, any additional increases in, in trash or water or gas that you might not forward on to your tenant. And another big one, especially if you've owned your property for a long time, is additional property taxes that you might, um, that you might have because there may be a reassessment after the building permit is uh, completed for the ADU. So you take the um, rental income, you subtract any expenses, and then you subtract your loan payment. And after, after, if you have a negative value, then your unit is not cash flowing. If you have money left over, then you are cash flowing. And um, that's really the, the calculation that you Uh, want to go through when that's the the calculation that you want to go through when you're figuring out that you want to rent an a, a, rent an ADU. Um, if you're not planning on renting the ADU, then what you're looking at is you're still looking at that loan payment, at your personal income. So, if, for instance, if that loan payment is two thousand dollars a month, if you can support that um, without you know, if you can support that loan payment. And that's something that the bank is going to be uh, looking at as well. Um, so the big question, the thing, the big question is then, um, well, how, how do construction costs play into this? And this is something that um, Builds can help you with. We do something called a site assessment that helps consumers kind of, uh, assess based on the type of, um, unit that they want to install, how much the construction costs are. But we also have prepared a little, um, a sample 
uh, what we call a sample ABU sheet, which shows you, compares the cost of construction based on different types of units. And I'm going to ask uh, Carlos to go through that, I think, and I'll ask Ryan to put that on the screen. Uh, and just before we do that, we have had a question pop in. Oh. Um, one of our guests is asking if junior ADU creation triggers the same kind of reassessment for taxes um, and under what conditions could you avoid triggering that reassessment? Okay, so um, in terms of the reassessment, normally uh, cities or, or counties will do a reassessment whenever a building permit is completed. So even if you're doing an addition to your bathroom, it might be a trigger for them to come out. Um, it's discretionary at the county level. Here in Alameda County, they will come out because they like to collect their taxes here. Um, and so the only way to prevent a, um, an assessment is to basically not have it attached to the land. So if it was a mobile home, um, but that's going to have a different value and a different lending um, type for you. And then the other piece of his question is, uh, can can he build a JADU as part of the front of an existing house? And can he build a JADU in the cellar? Sure. So I'll take it one by one. In terms of uh, adding a JADU to the front of the house, typically jurisdictions don't allow it. It's jurisdiction by jurisdiction. Um, if it's going to change the look of the house, you might there might be some uh, restrictions. It's, it's much more allowable when it's not affecting um, how the facade, the front of the facade looks, um, but you'd have to look at the jurisdiction's uh, planning application for that. Um, in terms of like a bump out or something being in front of the existing uh, home, I guess is what you're you're talking about there. Um, in terms of building in the cellar, there are requirements if you build um, subterranean and that, that does add your additional cost. And I'll let, kind of punt that to Carlos because he can speak a little bit generally to building in a, a, um, a small 500 square foot or less unit in the basement or subterranean. Uh, and let me uh, pull up my my own sheet here so that I can screen share, um, just so that it's easier for me to use my cursor to point. Okay, so um, Laura, you'd like for me to speak on what specifically? Uh, well, two things. First, if you could, there was a question about uh, additional costs related to building in a subterranean area. Mm -hmm. And then um, maybe if you could just explain how you, how the different costs are related to these different product uh, ADU types for folks. Yeah, and it would be uh, useful to know, uh, since we have a small group here today, if, is it possible to get a bit of um, uh, back on people's interests? Uh, are, are people here on the call specifically interested in one product over another? Do you have a sense, Ryan, of... Um, it's always useful to know who I'm speaking with in terms of the audience. If I'm speaking to a group of general contractors and I can drill down and become really specific, if I'm talking to uh, people who are not in the world of general contracting or development, then um, I can keep it a little bit higher level. Well, for example, so Keen, who asked this question, is really asking about building an ADU. And so it sounds like a homeowner, like a lot of the audience. Um, and then uh, we haven't, uh, I've got, I've got a, a couple pre-questions from some other attendees so I can speak to them being homeowners too. And then if anybody else wants to introduce themselves in the chat as a, a, as a more professional person uh, or, or speak up, feel free to. But I think most of the audience is homeowners this today. Got it. Yeah, and if anybody wants to speak up and introduce yourselves and your interest, uh, please feel free. It's always uh, nice to sort of personalize things and be friends here. Um, otherwise, no need to. I know a lot of people prefer to just receive information, which is totally fine. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll pause for a second here to allow anybody to start talking or jump in. Otherwise, I'll jump right into this spreadsheet. I'm, I'm Calvin Kearns. I'm a general contractor down in uh, Camarillo, California, just outside of LA. And uh, I've been looking to start uh, building ADUs with uh, SIP walls. Have you done any of that yet? I uh, have not, no. And uh, Calvin, something, you're Calvin, yeah? Yeah, there's my way. Right on, something okay. told me you were a general contractor. Yep. Uh, I've not done SIP walls on uh, on these yet. Um, 
but uh, uh, we've done some work with um, prefabs uh, on site delivery with cranes, for example. Yeah. Okay. That's so, any, anything else, Kelvin? Are you right back, yeah. Margaret? I'm sure. Sure. Bye. Okay. Well, later I'll like, talk to you offline. Yeah, I'm enjoying Two-story, thousand square foot per four. Um, ADUs for backyards. Video. Okay. So we'll talk later. Okay. Uh, Mitch, uh, do you mind uh, hitting mute on your uh, screen there? Um, we're getting a little bit of background noise. Thank you, uh, Kelvin. I think what you said was you wanted to talk about a thousand square feet per floor. Yeah. yeah. Two-story ADU. Yeah. Uh, trying to get an idea because the more you go up it seems like the cost gets a little more because you're slowed down since the height yeah and i think laura you you have some info on height restrictions is it 16 feet height restriction and yeah uh, that's, yes that's correct and then is there a uh, square footage limit on the size of the adus um yeah the the, it depends on the jurisdiction. The cities have to allow by right um, an 800 square foot ADU that is uh, 16 feet high and meets the setback requirements. Um, after that, um, you have to look at their local uh, legislation to see uh, what they will allow. And so at 16 you, feet, is that to the ridge or is that just the second top, the ceiling and the second floor? I'm sorry, I can't hear what the. Yes, if it's, is it? To the top of the ridge or just to the uh, ceiling of the second floor, the height restriction? Typically in Oakland, it's to the ridge. Yeah. yeah that, that eliminates the idea of a second story. Yeah, exactly. You'd have to have seven and a half uh, feet per floor, but even that would be tight. Uh, and that's that's for the for the non-discretionary permits, right? Like that's yeah. the one that gets that, that you have a lot of kind of innate state rights. And, and if you, um, for the size restrictions too, if it's, uh, if it's got two or more bedrooms, then the, the state affords you, I think 1100 square feet minimum or something, or maybe a thousand square feet. So it goes up there. There's a bunch of provisions in SB uh, yeah. 881. So, so it really depends on what, what you're, what you're trying to build in particular and then what the local jurisdiction has managed to pass in terms of ordinances that's still enforceable with those new laws. Correct. If it's too peak though, the point that Kelvin's making is it pretty much restricts you to one floor in a mezzanine. Yes. Which I, I've heard what people, that's what people are doing. What I'm hearing you say is that if you want to go above 16 feet, then it becomes discretionary approval at, at planning, right? Yeah, you'd have to look at the local planning application and see if they can allow that. And in the general rubric, what um, if you have also any kind of limitations on your property, if you could apply for a variance or um, a discretionary approval, which means that they're going to make a call. But you don't know when you submit the application whether or not it will be approved. Thank you. And uh, we should probably, uh, Laura, are you 100% certain that 16 feet to the peak is is uh, the answer as opposed to the roof of the second floor? Is that something we should research? We could, re we would need to know the jurisdiction. It's, um, I know that the state legislation, the state, the, the, state, state the state still working on clarifying their rules. So it says 16 feet. It doesn't clarify whether it's the ridge or to the ceiling. So it's still subject to interpretation. The HCD is coming out with uh, their their further guidelines, which will uh, provide those clarifications. So at this point, it'd be uh, communicating with your lo local jurisdiction to find out how they're interpreting it, and also, and if you disagree with that, waiting to hear from HCD about how they're going to be interpreting it. And I understand that that is scheduled to happen very soon. So what happens, just to clarify, with new legislation is the um, the state legislature puts something out that says, hey, this is what we want to do, but it's not a, it's, it's a, it's policy with um, certain directives. And then the local agent, the state agencies have to put out further guidelines when somebody's like, well, what does that mean? Does that mean to the ridge or does that mean to the ceiling? And when you say this, what does it mean? Because you can't put everything just in the state code. So then the, now that that was passed effective January, the local, the state agency is providing this further direction to all builders so that we know what we can do. 
Excellent answer. Thank you. Uh, and great questions. Um, all right. So like, uh, one, one viewer's got its hand raised. Mitch, if you want to speak up, feel free to now. Uh, can you hear me? We can. Okay. I'm, I'm late joining. I was traveling. Uh, I apologize for joining late. No worries. Uh, glad you're here. Mine is kind of a weird question. I'm probably looking for some clarification. Not sure that you're going to be able to answer it, but any help would be appreciated. Uh, over on the central coast of uh, Cayucas area, I'm not sure if everybody's familiar with that. I bought a house in the mid um, in the mid 70s. It was built in the mid 50s, and by permit in the mid 60s, the garage was legally by permit converted to a studio. In 1990, the Cayuca Sanitation District decided that since it was a habitable space, they started charging me a second EDU fee, which I am now contesting. And the reason I'm contesting it is, uh, I know that you're unable to, to um, measure sewage, but their benchmark is by water usage, and my water usage is less than their sewage output. And it's a very small place. Any direction, any idea, anything like this before? Um, I don't know what else to say, I'm just at everybody's mercy. Yeah. So what you're saying is, is that you have a uh, the sanitation department has determined your fees because uh, your garage, because they're saying that your garage conversion is officially an ADU and they're using that to increase your fees? That is correct. And when did they increase your fees? I'm sorry? I... When did the increase take place? Uh, the earliest records are 1990. And at the time, at the time, number one, I did not realize that it could be appealed, number one. Number two, both places, the main house and the studio were rented. And obviously, fast forward many years later, I'm not, it's not necessary to, to rent them both. And um, it's just kind of a getaway place. And like I said, I'm, I'm trying to base it on water usage, which um, they obviously don't want to accept. And I believe I found a memorandum from maybe 19, uh, 2018 that says in that situation, it should be based on either square footage and or um, uh, like outlets or faucet outlets or traps or something like that. And since they don't have either criteria, I, I'm still pursuing that they should go on a percentage of the square footage. But obviously who I'm going against are just telling me I'm out of luck. So have you submitted a formal appeal? Uh, I uh, submitted a written appeal and uh, was denied. And then I appeared before the board on a formal appeal. Never got a vote, just was told that that was denied also. Yeah, I think um, uh, I probably need to know in more information, but it's, I mean, the challenge, I mean, it's this is a lot of these utility districts. I think that then the next step would be, I'd have to look it up is to see if you, is to go to a public utilities commission, but I don't know the 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 former for, off the top of my hand the appeal process for that sanitation district. Um, I think that the other challenge is that these fees have been in place for a really long time, so it's hard to appeal. Um, there are some new laws related to new ADUs and uh, what can be charged for it, but I don't think that it would be applied to uh, retroactively, um, and it doesn't sound like the those new laws which say that once you build an, a, a new ADU there, there can't be these uh, additional kind of impact fees would apply here because you're not talking about a newly installed ADU. Uh, fully understand my, part of my contention was like I said I bought it in the mid 70s. Um, it sits in front of the house so uh, I was not hiding until the 90s and all of a sudden in the 90s actually January 1st of 1990, they uh, felt the second fee um, was warranted. So uh, I wasn't hiding from the mid 60s to the 90s. So I was legal then, then they changed their criteria, which now charged the second fee. And now the new laws came. Uh, maybe I wish the ADU laws had said somebody from history would be exempt or something, but they can't think of every scenario. And I understand that. Yeah. 
But we can talk offline about that if, um, if you'd like to have some further assistance. I had to talk to you back in recto at that because of, uh, it's been 30 years. You, you so mean, it has 30 years. years of history is what you're saying. Yeah, if you caught it back in 1990, it could have been a lot easier than trying to do it 30 years later. Uh, understand like i said back at the time i was uh, still employed at a very good job i happen to be 75 now so i mean that's kind of a poor excuse but both units were rented the fees were not prohibitive at the time and it was basically uh, absorbed by itself or but from the rent from both places now the criteria has changed and i fully agree with you on the history part of my contention is though that like there's a member on the board when i appealed that uh, lives in the area full-time has a house that's more than three times my size with a um, full-time, he, his wife, and two young daughters who he admitted in the meeting wash their hair almost every day. And, and my contention is that, well, you obviously, your water usage has got to be greater than mine. So I am not the one that is abusing your system. <laughs> Well, Mitch, we're, we'll, we'll take it offline with you. I remember seeing your email. So I've got a lot of the details and the uh, link to the appeal form, if that's helpful. And so we'll, okay. we'll grab it with you after this uh, webinar and, right. uh, and wrestle it with you uh, later on down the road. Thank you for bringing your question. Glad you guys were there. Thanks a million. Yeah. And so handing it back to Carlos, who can go through some of the sample ADU costs. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, so let me... Uh, Make sure my I'm not muted. Uh, back to this thing. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. All right. So this um, this worksheet here. Uh, I'm trying to minimize you all. Okay. This worksheet here is a um, very high level assessment that looks at um, assume square footage. Let me just kind of go through on the left hand side here. This column is the type of ADU everywhere from shipping container uh, to garage conversions, basement conversions. You see here uh, detached ADU with a traditional prefab modular uh, and um, uh, yeah. And then uh, modern versus non-modern for example. And then we have uh, uh, detached ADU that's on site on on site built um, regular stick build with uh, easy to access site level ground versus a uh, slope difficult to access and uh, so what we've done here is giving you about uh, an approximate price per square foot and these numbers are um, hard costs and it depends on the area obviously Los Angeles costs are much cheaper than Bay Area costs for example San Diego costs are cheaper than Los Angeles costs. Uh, and um, it's more expensive in San Francisco than to build in Oakland. So these are sort of Oakland based or East Bay costs, which are a little higher than statewide, uh, significantly higher than San Diego, we know. So, but, uh, but, so keep in mind that uh, you sort of have to look at these numbers uh, with that in mind. These are East Bay, East Bay numbers, hard costs primarily. Uh, so that's this co column here is total cost, which is the assumed square footage of the unit. And then the price per square foot gives you your total cost of your unit. Uh, and then we're looking at, uh, I'm sorry, that also includes uh, soft costs. So permit fees, utility connections, utility applications, um, and then management costs would be included in this, uh, this column here. So this is uh, most of your soft costs and your hard costs are in this column. Your monthly uh, rent in, uh, in Oakland, this is about what you get for them. And the reason we created this spreadsheet is to give a sense of the kind of unit you may want and what you can expect in terms of valuation and net equity. Again, based on East Bay, and we can do these in your specific area once we can talk to some of the brokers in your area. But we know that in Oakland, what the rents are going for. And then we use what's called the capitalization rate uh, for those who aren't... Uh, developers it's it's kind of like your um your um it's just a variable that allows you to determine the total value of your property based on the rents you get uh and so that gives you a valuation and then net equity is simply your valuation minus your total cost to build um and so this probably represents about 90 percent of your total costs the other costs might be things like uh uh, some unanticipated um, uh, impact fees in your city. 
um, that kind of thing. And then over here is your time to design and install. Um, so 10 months uh, would be design application, submitting your application to the city, getting your building permit pull, pulled, and then actually installing the unit. So now that I've sort of explained the various columns to you, and again, the intention here is for you all to see, oh, I really wanted to build a, um, uh, let's say a, a detached ADU prefab modular, um, but now I feel like I wanna do a, an onsite uh, stick build construction. Uh, you'll see that there's a big difference in, in your equity that you can get because of the different uh, differences in, in cost to build between one that's very difficult to uh, to build an access on site um, versus one that might be um, more amenable for uh, modular. Um, anyways, so so uh, starting with um, top one here, shipping container, you, you can actually get a, a shipping container uh, conversion to residential online. And this is only, this, does, this excludes shipping costs. You also have to build a, um, a slab foundation in most cases or uh, install footings. Um, but you can see that uh, there's, there's, uh, they're pretty inexpensive. And this is a good option. Uh, there are some uh, sh shipping container conversions to residential manufacturers out there, and they're popping up more and more. Uh, we're actually looking at uh, designing uh, one here in Oakland since we have a lot of shipping containers. And, uh, and you'll see that the rents are pretty strong, so that actually has pretty good net equity. Um, then going on to the garage conversion to ADU, I'll go through these uh, quickly. Garage conversion to ADU with existing foundation. So if your garage was designed recently, your home was designed recently, let's say in the last 20 or 30 years, and you have a, a, a nice thick slab in there with good perimeter footings, uh, then pretty, pretty low cost to build. Actually, uh, $300 a square foot is probably on the high side. So it's probably one of the easiest ways to get an accessory dwelling unit is to convert your garage. And that's probably one of the first places you should look if you're looking to do a, a, an accessory dwelling unit. Uh, it doesn't mean that you don't need the parking space in your garage uh, and the city hasn't passed any legislation uh, to, to uh, prevent it. Because it's fast, uh, you can do it in six months or less. It's relatively straightforward. And if you have your um, plumbing lines and your electrical and your HVAC accessible from there, then it actually can happen even faster and cheaper. So your garage is probably one of your best options. If you don't have an existing, let's say that you have a cracked slab, you have an old garage, your perimeter footing around your garage is, is uh, thin or brittle because you have an old home, then your costs go up. Um, so that's one of the first things to look at is your garage and what's my slab and what does my per perimeter footings look like? Uh, is this a kind of situation where I'd have to um, shore up my walls, build new footings around my walls and my garage? So, um, but it's a question worth asking and, and we're happy to help with that if, um, if you're interested in looking at that. Uh, then, then once, uh, you know, if you have a basement and you have a seven foot, seven and a half foot uh, basement, um, even a six foot basement, it, you, you can uh, relatively inexpensively uh, convert that basement into um, a residential uh, ADU without too much um, cost. Uh, certainly, if you have, if your foundation is um, underground, let's say that two, uh, a third of it, or more than a third of it, half of it is uh, below your uh, grade, then it becomes much more expensive because you have to waterproof all of your walls and you have to um, you know, rip up your your foundation and put in new waterproofing underneath your slab. Uh, so it becomes more expensive and and uh, then probably cost prohibitive in some cases. If you have to raise your house uh, too much, it's probably easier to just put one in your yard. So we can help you with this, that as well. Uh, okay, uh, before you move on from the conversions, it looks like um, Calvin's got his hand raised. Sure. Well, talking back at the uh, shipping containers, uh, have you considered jack screws, or excuse me, earth screws? Basically, they're like big augers. Like helical piers? Helical piers? Uh, well, there's two the foundation. Parts, but a rigor, uh, threaded thing it looks like a big wood screw that you drive into the ground. That way, all you do is bring all the same height, and then you just weld, tack weld them around to the shipping container. Saves you a lot of time yeah. for and cement. You're talking about for the foundation? Well, for the base to set the can on. Yeah. Yeah, actually, we, we are working with a company through uh, one of our modular builders, and um, it's a helical peer company 
and I'm not sure if that's the same thing that you're referring to, but they just drill them right into the ground and we set yep. the container right on top of them. Yeah. And and, it yeah. One in each corner, you bolt it down. And yeah, that's something that's actually one of the most costly ways of, of uh, basically creating our, our foundation. So, uh, and, and it, they'll test the, the soil at the same time for their product, which is a really convenient way. So we, we've looked at that and we actually found it to be pretty useful. I think it's a, a Boju is also using, I think that kind of foundation and uh, it might be another prefab company if people want to just do research on what's being done out there. Thank you. Okay, uh, so we looked at uh, converting existing space. So again, garages being one of your most efficient and expedited ways, basements also, but basements can be tricky if they're uh, beneath your grade too much, including getting your window heights correct and all that, it could be pretty challenging. So uh, that's worth looking into first though. Once you get out of your existing footprint of your home, uh, now you're looking at detached, you can go modular detached. Um, and then it's just a question of how much you wanna spend on the actual modular unit. You can go you know, traditional pretty inexpensively. If you wanna get fancy and go with modern, uh, then you'll just start paying more for your finishes. Um, and then from there, uh, going up to uh, your more expensive but greatest flexibility is just your detached stick built uh, units. And uh, what, we, what we're finding out here in the Bay Area is that they're ranging from $300 a square foot to about $450 a square foot. Um, and, and they can range from uh, what you choose to put in finishes to how difficult the site is to build. If you have a slope lot uh, that's difficult to access, then your costs are going up pretty significantly at that point. And really at, at that point, it's important to get an architect in there and do a very site specific design as opposed to an off the shelf design that may not work on a slope lot. Uh, so you'll see the construction costs here on, on this column here. They're, they're pretty variable depending on what you choose. And then your rents aren't all that variable, which is the challenge because your rents uh, here in the East Bay may range um, from $1,500 to $2,300 for the unit, presuming they're all about 500 square feet in size. And you'll see here on this column, which is net equity, that uh, you're, what you're creating in terms of value for your property can vary from, in this case, by the way of this example, $88,000 for a garage conversion that's very um, expense, that's expensive uh, because we have to do a new foundation, for example, or for a basement with a new need for a new foundation. Uh, but you can get up to almost $200,000 in net equity if you throw in a, um, a detached ADU, traditional prefab modular that you're able to rent. So in many cases, that, that might be your best bet. Just bringing on a, a modular, putting it in your yard and renting it out for uh, a good amount of, of money because renters tend not to be all that um, picky as long as they have a nice uh, warm place that's comfortable to live in. So that, that rounds it out. I'm happy to answer questions. Um, How do you figure the equity that you have? Is that based off the cash flow? Yeah, it's based off cash flow. So the way that I did the calculation here uh, is, let me move this around. Uh, so the, the, the monthly rent, I took the monthly rent, I multiplied it times 12, I took a 30% expense ratio. So I took 70% of this number times 12, uh, 12 months. So I get my annual net operating income. And uh, now here's the key in the East Bay, it's really in Oakland, our capitalization rate is anywhere from five to 6%. So I believe what I used was a, a five and a half percent capitalization rate, you know, cap rate um, and a 30% expense ratio, which are the two primary variables. After you're, um, you've figured out what your rents are gonna be and you'll uh, reduce it by your expenses and your vacancy rate. Uh, we have very low vacancy rate out here of about 3% right now. So that's what I used. And then from there, you get your, your valuation. So it's monthly rent times 12 for a year. It's uh, multiplied times 0.7 or 0.65, depending on your expense ratio. And then you divide that by your capitalization rate, and that gets you your, your valuation. Uh, we've got another question that's popped up in chat about, um, is, is cap rate uh, for a residential ADU a methodology that you can expect your bank to be using when they value your property or is that still being worked out? 
still being worked out. We've actually met with a number of banks uh, to ask them how they would determine value. And they have not figured that out yet. This is a pretty new program coming out. Uh, and that's actually one of the things that we're working out with the city of Oakland, actually, as we're going to ramp up a bunch of uh, ADUs out here. Uh, one of the ways we're trying to figure out is how, how the bank will determine value for the ADUs. And Laura, I don't know if you've learned anything recently on that, but I know as of about a month and a half ago, they were still trying to figure that out. Uh, this is standard for rental income, which is it, it will probably end up being the primary approach uh, for banks because it's very simple. Uh, what rents can you get? And um, uh, I think one of the challenges for them is the cap rate because it's an ADU as opposed to primary residence they may uh, use a um, higher cap rate uh, to determine value, so. And in my understanding, so I think that the cap rate is valuable for looking at different values across um, uh, projects like this. Appraisers and banks in single family home contexts often use uh, comparable values uh, in their reports versus cap rates, which will uh, appear in more, appear more frequently in um, multifamily. However, it'd be really difficult uh, to see comp to, for us to show you comps for all of these different types of units um, in a chart like this. And basically what cap rates do is, is a kind of a, a mathematical way of showing how, uh, how com uh, comps work in that particular area. Um, so in terms to, sh to summarize, typically what a bank will do is look at the appraisal and what appraisals have been coming back on in the single family home context, most likely is gonna be um, comparative homes in the area that have ADUs, but those, and but that's a challenge, right? Because uh, not that many homes in your area might have ADUs. So it's extremely um, subjective right now. And there isn't a policy across all appraisers or even across in particular counties um, in terms of when they do that reassessment. So it's something that's still being worked out. I'm gonna pop, um, sorry, I'm gonna pop a link into the chat from uh, Cole's webinar last week. So he, he works up in Portland. Um, they're, they've got a different adoption rate up there uh, where ADUs are, are uh, there's more comparables, at least in, in the Portland market. And so he walked through a couple of the financial institutions up there that also serve uh, California, like Amqua. Um, and, and there's a list, I think, that he provided. Uh, so I'll, I'll pop a link in. If you're more interested in that subject, then you can, you can pursue that, watch that video. Uh, and then we've got a finance specialist coming in on Sunday. And I'll put a link into RSVP to that too, if you're interested in more of that conversation. Thank you. So um, I think that Carlos went through his complete sheet and now is the time for um, any other questions and questions um, that we can answer. Our specialties are really uh, planning, entitlements, and construction. And it's okay if there are no questions. I've got one. I've got a, I've got a T-ball. So you guys have gone through a lot of different um, steps in figuring out how much you can afford. You've given a lot of different examples of how much cost can vary based on what kind of project you're doing. But a lot of this requires a little bit of technical expertise. So if somebody in the audience is like, I got a garage, how do I know if it's going to be the one hundred and fifty dollars or $200,000 project? How do they figure that out? Well, we have a, a product that is a site assessment where we um, check out, understand what you want to build and also um, look into different cost variables at your site, site and provide you with a report that gives you kind of a rough order of magnitude on your budget. Typically that costs uh, $500, but uh, because we did this, podcasting. We have a great relationship with Ryan and how to ADU. We would do that for uh, $250 if you uh, order that in the next week. Um, if you're going to do that on your own, uh, you would, um, gee, you'd have to do a lot of things. First, you check the zoning to see what was allowable. 
and whether or not your proposed um, what you want to build meets the requirements. And then you have to talk to a couple of contractors to see how much they would charge you for that that product. So thank you very much. As part of as part of the follow up to this, I'll, I'll send a link to the recording. I'll also include because uh, people asked about this, the ADU sample sheet that Carlos walked through. So if you if you want to look at that on your own time, you'll have it. And I'll include a sample uh, site assessment that that Bill Ziga provided. It kind of shows you what you get if you go through that process. Well, I was trying to analyze the difference between the 250 and the 400, and mostly on the 400, it seemed like it was because of the basements, that it, the more cost for that. But for the general um, ADUs or garage conversions, that all seems like it's just about the finishes that you put in. Whether you, you have a, a, a four panel fold door that slides to the left compared to just a standard uh, slider. I think that's where the cost differences are. Uh, cost difference between, uh, you're talking about the ADU with the existing foundation versus uh, without? Yeah. 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 I also assumed, because I wanted to be conservative on my, um, my high-end number, so I assumed that we'd have to do some waterproofing around the perimeter of the foundation. Uh, I'm sorry, of the um, retaining walls if, if we have subgrade uh, basement. Yeah. So that's the uh, other piece of it is the... Um, $50,000 that I built in for waterproofing. They got, they got all out, membrane and all that. Yeah. yeah. Put a French drain in and yeah. Uh, although I, what I didn't calculate uh, was if it's say three feet, four feet below grade and we have to get windows in, um, then I'd probably just suggest they shift to an alternative rather than, than uh, doing the basement. Cause then we have to lift the house in order to get window height correct. Well, okay. they're not allowing you in California to dig the hole out bigger so you can get a crawl window out? They are, although my experience is that that just starts driving up costs so much that it might become cost. If it's the only option, it might be a good option. But then we have to deal with uh, drainage, draining to the street from uh, water that would be retained within the uh, excavated area. And, and then it, it becomes uh, more and more cost prohibitive. Which, so I didn't factor that into this cost, uh, the $400 a square foot, um, just because um, from at that point, if it's that deep in, below grade, we'd probably want to shift to uh, uh, another option if there is one. Yeah. Well, I like some of the styles that you've done so far. The, the shipping container thing, Sounds good. It's just what are you using high bays primarily so you get enough ceiling height? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, we may, they do make uh, shipping containers with um, a higher uh, roof height of, I think, I believe it's eight and a half feet roof height. Um, and so we would have some, some about a foot to work with in terms of flooring, finished flooring and ceiling. Uh, so we, we actually haven't um, completed a prototype ourselves. Uh, we're looking into it, but we've we've found various shipping containers online. We haven't had the opportunity to to do a shipping container yet for residential, but they're out there. Um, they just have to be converted to the Title Twenty Four requirements in each jurisdiction. Yeah, I keep getting guys trying to talk me into building tiny houses. You can buy a, a travel trailer for cheaper than you can build one. So. Yeah, I'm convinced shipping containers are a great way to go. There's a few riddles that have to be solved, but I think um, they're, they're, you know, with Title 24 now, because you don't have to put gas in and because we can do it all with solar and meet Title 24 requirements, um, I think it's actually pretty feasible. Um, we, haven't, we haven't done one ourselves, like I said, but I'm, I'm uh, interested in doing one. I've got over 350 solar installs from San Diego to Paso Robles. Nice. Yeah. My niece uh, and door. <laughs> so. uh, homes, homes or on uh, ADUs or in general? Uh, all homes. Got it. Well, thank you for, for bringing some experience and some good questions, Calvin. And, and thank you for inviting uh, some other folks with your, with your uh, link. We really appreciate uh, you expanding the audience a little bit and helping other people figure out how they're going to do their ADUs. Yeah, because I try to research everything that's out there. So if I don't have a solution for one thing, I know somebody else has got something that may cure the problem. And then, you know, 
we work together and everybody's happy. So that's it. That's that it's at such an early stage. There's a lot, there's a lot of demand out there and we just need to figure out how to help people get their ADUs up. Carlos is interested in doing one shipping container. I want to do like a thousand. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, Melvin, where are you? I'm outside of LA. Okay. Well, you guys are, uh, when COVID come, uh, come back from COVID, you guys have a lot of, uh, a lot of ADUs out there. Oh yeah. We, we've been working the whole time. That's what slows down. Uh, That's one nice thing about us construction guys. Clean <laughs> air. Well, that's very exciting. Right. And, and another big thank you to everybody for attending. We're getting close to the hour. So I want to uh, respect Laura and Carlos's time. Uh, thank you guys again for sharing so much of your experience with us and how to ADU subscribers. And thank you everybody who attended. I'll send out the follow up soon. Uh, and also, if you enjoyed this, but you have questions about finance, Sunday's right around the corner. And we got Sean Weeks who's coming in talking a bit about what you could do uh, right now uh, with, with conventional lending um, and doing another Q&A style. So if you've got specific questions, he's, he's open to them. Okay, hey, thanks everybody. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for attending, guys. Thank you, Laura and Carlos. Thank you.